This is Heroin Addiction, presented by That Time I Got Reincarnated in the Same World as an Anime Podcaster. In this series, two old white guys discuss comics for Korean women. I'm Isakai Sensei Sama, aka Brad, and I'm joined by Bento Baggins, aka Ben. Hello. So, as we learned last time, I have uh, successfully hooked Ben on romance manhwa. <laughs> You have. This one was especially effective. Uh, the one so, that I just drew out of a hat. <laughs> so what did you? Uh, what series did you pick for this episode? Okay, I picked Author of My Own Destiny, which I believe is the official name. Yes. Since there was some discrepancy about that. Yeah, the, the title that uh, was around for a while until the official translation came out was... I became the wife of the male lead, which is a bit of a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that is a huge spoiler. Oh, my God. Uh, so Not that these generally go any other way, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's based on an original novel by Winterleaf, adapted by Furik. That's what it looks like. I do not know how to pronounce a lot of Korean as we've discussed. So I don't know who the art is. I'm not going to try. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go educate myself on how to pronounce that before I go much further with that. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, I'll uh, do the summary real quick and then we'll, we'll dive into it and we'll see how you liked it. Evil mage Fiona Green was destined to die at the hands of the protagonist couple in The Emperor and the Saint. That is, until the story's author became Fiona herself. Though mistreated, cast out by her pompous family, and thrown into the battle at Halon, Fiona is determined to use her magic for good. But things take a rather unexpected turn when she rescues the male lead, Sigrin, turning him from foe to friend. Will she successfully rewrite her fate without changing the story's happy ending? And the answer is no. <laughs> she screws everything up, but not in a bad way. Yeah, it's tough to... I, I don't know. How far ahead is the fan translation? Because I read what I think is the official. Yeah, it's not... Uh, the fan translation is only like four or five chapters into season two. So okay. not not too much farther. I expect the official one to start uh, releasing again pretty soon. So what I read for the first one was, I guess, all of season one. And that's probably it. I think I read the official translation. You're talking about Kill the Villainous? <laughs> no, for... You said the Author first my... one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let me get out my notes. <laughs> okay. I've got I've got thoughts recorded. So yeah, I like this more than Kill the Villainous. I, I was, <laughs> you know, go on. I'm sorry. I was really surprised. So just to give everybody a peek behind the curtain, we're actually recording this only a week after we recorded the last one, because as soon as we finished that recording, Ben jumped in <laughs> to, to the next <laughs> series and just blew through it. I didn't expect to. I thought it would take roughly as long as, as Kill the Villainous. I had a lot of other stuff to do. Now, you got me at a pretty good point because what I'm working on for the other podcast is a book I absolutely hate. <laughs> and so I was trying to find any way to distract myself. But it wasn't very hard. Like, I caught myself... Because this is, like, a little thing meant to be read on cell phones, it's very easy to, like, during a boring meeting, just, you know, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Very consumable. So, uh, yeah, I blew through it. I got really addicted. I wanted to see where Fiona's story was going. I wanted to see if it would pay off. I think that was my... I got invested in the romance because like, I wanted her and Seagrin to get together. And I wanted... I wanted her to let Abel be her father. That was another arc I got very invested in. I want, 
I, you know, the thing that they set up and pay off really early on is the dynamic between her and her family and the people who wrong her. She takes like swift and and just vengeance on everybody. Yeah. So uh, when when you said you wanted to record this weekend, uh, so last night I I went and reread twenty five chapters, um, <laughs> and yeah, I was uh, I was sort of surprised by how quickly things sort of move along. Now there's some there's some main points that are a little slow, and we'll get into that, but. Yeah, the the way that her family mistreats her gets resolved fairly quickly. Not in their timeline because, you know, she she comes back after 5 years or whatever it is. Um, but her sort of revenge that she takes sort of for the original Fiona um is it, quite quick. I think it's only like 3 chapters they they wrap all that up. And it's very satisfying because she comes back and is immediately mistreated again. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I think she points this out, but it's like, I'm so glad you haven't changed because that makes taking this revenge. Now feel I get to do what I came to right. do. It makes it feel right. <laughs> I, when, when I was reading it, I marathoned it. So it did not seem like it was resolved quickly to me. I, I was like, I don't care about the greens. I want to know what's going on with her and Seagrin. <laughs> but it it is much better paced. Because I, I told you, I think, that one of the things I'm afraid of as I get into this genre is that I'm going to run into comics that run for hundreds of chapters and it's just constantly teasing the main romance. Because <laughs> That does happen quite a lot. Yeah, and... I can do a little bit of that, but there has to be some payoff at some point. Well, and so this actually brings up an uh, interesting topic um, because this that is a thing that happens enough. And generally, the trope is that the protagonist, the female lead, is very dumb and usually specifically about that relationship. Most of the time, and, and uh, Author of My Own Destiny is a prime example of this, the, the female lead is very capable, um, you know, mentally strong, um, and, like, won't take shit from people, and, like, can read people, and all this kind of stuff. But only in the case of the male lead, she has no idea what his feelings are. And so I've actually got a name for this. Um, you can check out the blog if you want more information. It's called Dense Female Lead Syndrome. There's actually a type 1 and a type 2 for Dense Female Lead Syndrome. Oh, I don't know about this. So type 1 is the standard. The female lead cannot understand what the male lead's feelings for her are until he literally spells it out for her. Um, even though everyone around her knows what's going on. And type two is the female lead is so stuck on keeping the original story that despite the fact that the world is drastically changing around her, she's still going like, oh, I need to do this so that uh, this happens from the main story or whatever. Even though, you know, she's obviously so drastically changed the story at this point through all of her actions. So, so this is a type two. This is this is type one and type two. It's <laughs> it's not the worst case that I've seen, but it's one of the worst. Uh, oh, I, I'd rank this probably uh -oh. three, four in in series I've read. As uh, however, the uh, the very worst case of this is so bad that it pales like this case pales in comparison. <laughs> so I don't. Know. I didn't get the vibe that she was particularly dense. One of the things that hooked me about this story, though, is the fact that she is an author and I do a book podcast <laughs> and I do a little bit of writing on my own. And I appreciated the humor of her, A, constantly disparaging her own work as relying heavily on tropes <laughs> yeah. and being just 
cheesy romance that like she put together from like basically a Lego set of preconceived romantic subplots. But then also she's super attached to her characters and wants them to fulfill the roles she laid out for them. She truly believes that the best thing for Seagrin is to get with her intended protagonist of Eunice. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I think she's particularly dense about Seagrin's feelings towards her. I think definitely by the time Seagrin hugs her, which is like a big moment. I know it doesn't sound like much, but like he comes up behind her one night and he hugs her and it's like not a friendly hug. And she's like, well, we're never going to, we're just not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about what happened that night. So I think, you know, she's like I said, it's not the worst case I've ever seen, but she's definitely in denial about it. I, I think she doesn't want it, but I think, she knows how he feels, but I think, and I could be projecting because I got too into it, but I think she is mostly in denial about her own feelings. I think she's constantly like, when Sigrin meets Eunice, she's like excited for it, but then she's like, but why am I also a little disappointed? Yeah. I... <clears throat> And she doesn't really know why she's disappointed, but I think she knows. And she's pur- the fact that she's purposely avoiding ever mentioning that hug again <laughs> no, means she knows what it meant. I think she's in a difficult situation because for the longest time, she treated him as a child, her mm-hmm. child, that she yeah. needed to nurture and help grow up, and completely missed the fact that she was younger than him and being so kind to someone who had never had any kindness before is a surefire way to get someone to fall in love with you. (laughs) Oh yeah. Well, uh, but she has also fallen for him. Yeah. I would say not to the same degree though. No, she's well, he's ready to like admit it and chase her halfway around the world. And and that's the romance part of it that he's Mm -hmm. willing to do anything for her he kills a dragon just to be able to get to the capital he reclaims his title which he has no interest in just to be able to go to the capital where she went on a whim but secondary to that is like and this is the one that was like nettling me the most i can understand the complexities of not wanting to go from villainous to heroine in a story you wrote because not only is there the ego of the author that she wants to preserve her vision but there's also the fact that as long as this story stays on the rails she essentially knows the future so a lot of her power can come from the fact that she knows exactly what's going to happen she knows exactly what everybody's going to do and if she starts changing things and then she's just living real life again and she's she's in danger except she does want to she she wants to live real life yeah she wants to escape you know dying but she doesn't want to change it that much she just wants to quietly fade into the background and right. not be the villainous but if she marries the emperor then she's the center of world politics which However, she very much doesn't want to be then as soon as she meets the not final boss villainous, the main love interest villainous of the series. She mm. f- falls in love with her and I was gonna wants ask, to rescue her from her fate. <laughs> so I was going to ask, I do you think Livia is in love with Fiona? I mean, in any of these Japanese or Korean series... It's always difficult to tell what the author's intention is because of for same sex relationships, because the culture over there is is weird about that. I mean, there's there's no beating around the bush with that. Well, yeah, I know. I don't know the laws in Korea, but I know Japan still doesn't allow gay marriage. Right. Uh, However, and, and it's definitely worse in Japan. Um, I think Korea is more South Korea is more open about it. Um, but it's always difficult to tell like what their intention is, is like, 
are they going for the actual romantic love angle or are they just going for the closest friends angle yeah in, I... in, in this case i don't uh i didn't get a full-on romantic interest feeling from it it's def it definitely skirts the line but i don't <laughs> think it crosses it do you know the uh sappho and her friend subreddit yeah yeah that if if i look at their relationship and I don't think there's some romantic tension there. I feel like I'm, I'm doing a Sappho and her friend. Yeah, and that's. I mean, I if someone told me no, I think that they have romantic love. I wouldn't argue that. Um, I, I don't know if it's quite love yet. They they haven't gotten to know each other well enough. But there's definitely like a spark there. And, and part there's of it, a, there's a particular scene that I'm thinking about as I say that, and it is the scene where. Uh, Livia is dressed up, you know, as, as the noble lady. They're all going on um, the, this world's version of a fox hunt, which is the monster hunt. Mm. And Fiona is dressed, and I'm going to talk about the fashion. Fiona is dressed in like this riding outfit of like military jacket with epaulets and um, riding pants. So she looks like a nobleman going on the hunt and and Livia is dressed as the noblewoman and Fiona promises to you know basically ask her favor and and present her with the tribute at the end of the hunt and yeah I know Livia is mostly doing that to avoid having a guy who is a creepy stalker who definitely means her harm she's trying to keep him from claiming that honor and getting involved in that whole political mess. So there's, there is a non romantic political element to this. And I, I don't think Fiona is necessarily reciprocating the love interest, but I don't know. There's something more going on with Livia. I, I need to know more. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is that as Fiona goes through all this and like meets these different characters, she is, she's somewhat infatuated with all of them because she wrote them and is seeing them and like going oh yeah they are super beautiful like <laughs> i wrote them to be the most beautiful because they're the main characters and everything but yeah i'm i'm head over heels for them because they're so beautiful cuz even the the ones who are like originally villains it's like oh yeah they're super beautiful too i need to be careful but look how beautiful they are can I say this is this is purely coming from a words about books perspective, but I read a mix of very good and very bad books. <laughs> yeah. And this would be in the line of something that's a little bit cheesier, but it's self-aware of its cheesiness. So it's it's not bad. Mm-hmm. But the thing I absolutely love and I have no idea if it's intentional is that Fiona is constantly acknowledging how lazy she was in writing the backstory. Yeah. That that she's just like, I wrote that he had a harsh childhood. And then she's just blown away by the human impact of what a harsh childhood looks like. Yeah. And she's like, oh, if I'd known that, I would have... De- like." Basically, she's acknowledging that there was so much room for development in her story <laughs> and that, that she ignored a ton of emotional depth and trauma. And and what I like about it, though, is that then the action, there's a meta thing going on here of uh, Winter Leaf or whoever wrote the original novel must be like they are writing about the actual trauma. And so maybe are they're making fun of romance novels a little bit for That's not a good question is it satire <laughs> or, you know i think there's at least if it's not satire it's at least poking fun at, at maybe a a well-loved but silly trope yeah and i i don't think it comes from a place of wanting to criticize but it is funny that just all the accidental emotional growth that goes on because they've purposely decided every little thing Fiona wrote that was just an offhand comment to get to the, the yummy bits. Uh, I'm going to explore. I'm going to 
Sig- Sigrun is a traumatized young child who watched his mother die, and that's going to complicate things when he meets his mommy girlfriend. And then, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Livia is the villainous, but she's also being sexually harassed by politically powerful men who she can't fight back against. Well, in and the original, uh, Fiona was a tragic character because she's abused as a child, as an illegitimate child of the count and brought into the home and the the family doesn't really want her there. And then they send her off to die uh, on the front lines of a horrible monster filled place. Um, And, you know, she, she in, in another story, in another story than the original story that this story is about, uh, <laughs> she would have been a heroine because of that tragic past. And like, she would have, it would have been a rags to riches thing and she would have found her power. And, but then the, the author of that story put that twist in there of like, no, she actually develops into the, the super powerful villainous, character well, and i think the other thing they they talk about it really quick and i don't know if they're coming back to it is that i'm gonna butcher his name aren't the the red-headed clovis uh, yeah he's we'll call him he's, clovis son he, clovis son yes uh <laughs> clovis clovis onison <laughs> uh yeah now it's weird so <laughs> He has some kind of magical curse or affliction from the darkness. And the original Fiona attempted to help cure him of the darkness, but was herself then consumed by the darkness. And that's how she needs to be like put down like a dog. Mm-hmm. And her soul tormented for eternity for some reason. <laughs> yeah, that was like, uh, I don't know. But... It's what I was talking about with the last one where they're kind of doing the, like there's equal parts Maleficent and Isekai. Of yeah. The villainess was actually not a villainess. She was just a, a lady who had a hard time, fell in with the, tried to help the wrong person and wound up damned for all time for it. And we're supposed to, you know, congratulate the guy who cuts her head off. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, an interesting aspect to this, um, there's a lot of different series that do the author goes into their own work kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And a running theme of those is exactly what you talked about with, oh, I just wrote this offhand to like make it a better story, but look at all these people who are suffering now that I, I'm in this world and seeing them. And they always do that same thing where the person feels guilty the author feels guilty about that. And in this one, it's a pretty strong thing. Like she goes about her entire life because of the guilt she feels for Sigrun. Um, I think it's really strange because it feels like all of these, it the, feels like the, the theme actual is don't, don't imagine interesting stories because right. you're hurting fictional people. Right. The it it feels like the actual author is is saying that like oh you know you got to <laughs> think about who you're affecting and it's like no these are fictional characters this isn't a real thing like <laughs> I did take it as at the very least what I I did get that vibe and I had that initial reaction of are you telling me like don't create conflict in my stories. You can't be because you're writing a story with conflict right now. I mean, a bunch of people, we, we can do this on and on into eternity. Like one of the dudes who got emasculated and tossed off the wall could actually have been a troubled orphan himself. And then he, and it's like, you got to have conflict, but I think what they're trying to say, and maybe this is a very charitable interpretation is it, deserves attention. You shouldn't just use it as a shortcut. Mm-hmm. If, if you're going to create trauma and conflict, explore it. it. At least go into the complexities of people and, and don't just call Fiona a villainess. She's not just a villainess. She's a human being. Yeah. And nobody was good or bad. And, and again, that's, 
that's reading a lot into this little cell phone comic. <laughs> well, I'm going to read into it even further right now because she goes on and on about Sigrin's horrible childhood and how she just glossed over it, but look at all this horrible stuff that happened to her. And yet, the Green family, the Count, who abused her as a child and was horrible to her and sent her off to die, she doesn't... She gets revenge on them. She doesn't care that she wrote them to be that way. That's a good point, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I was I was glancing at the comics as I or the comics. I was glancing at the comments as I was reading down through these chapters and there were so many people just angry like haven't you realized they're full human beings this isn't the same story you wrote it's changed like just go ahead and marry him. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I had to uh come up with a definition for dense female lead syndrome. It definitely angers people. It's, I mean, that blog post has over 320 some views at this <laughs> wow. point. Like, yeah, wow. people, people are really drawn to that. You're, you're being cited in papers right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. The only, the, the only other point in my notes that we haven't hit is, uh, I have to talk about the art and specifically the fashion Okay, so before we dive into that, because there's one thing that I wanted to go over that's sort of a world building thing, and right. that is I really like the magic system in this in this world because a lot of times you have these stories and the magic system is very open ended, and magic can do so many things and can basically solve all of the problems mm -hmm. and you'll have the mage and the mage can like teleport and fly and like conjure everything out of thin air and do everything ever. And, you know, as they become more and more powerful, they can just do literally whatever. And it sort of destroys any kind of conflict that the series could have that could be interesting and, you know, be dramatic and everything. Because if, the female lead is this super powerful magician that can do anything like why why should i feel you know scared or or tense or whatever when she gets in any situation she can just snap her fingers and get out of it right mm -hmm. in this series the magic system seems very grounded and realistic because magic at least as far as i can tell at this point seems to be limited to natural phenomenon mm. so fiona is a super powerful powerful mage but basically all of her spells that she does consist of lightning bolts and you know water bullets and uh columns of fire and stuff like she's not conjuring She's weapons bend, out of bending the and, fabric of reality right itself she and, can't teleport she can't fly but they continue to say she's the most powerful mage so it's not like there's other mages that can do those things i think calling it a system might be a little much but they definitely they don't clearly define what she can and can't do but they do clearly define that she has limits and that other people have even stricter limits. Like, they, yeah, they constantly compare other mages who are considered to be very good at magic to being able to cover or conjure like a fireball the size of a soccer ball. And that's considered advanced. Right. And then she comes out and like busts out a hundred foot fire column tornado thing. That... But they're always very clear that she can't do that forever. Right. So... She, she has like a few big tricks in her and then she collapses basically yeah they talk about pretty early on about how using magic to be more powerful you have to be efficient so it seems like every spell has like the same the same way to use it but your ability to be a to efficiently use the magic power in that spell makes it more powerful. 
Yeah, and it's so, kind of like like a good, fast, cheap thing where you can you can throw value or money or mana at the problem and get the result, but that mana is actually you know your life. Right. <laughs> so you want to be economical with it. Right. You want to get the biggest result for the smallest cost. And she's very good at that, but that's also the limit they set right at the beginning. And there's a little bit of tension when Clovis Onichan comes in and talks about his 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 darkness. Yeah, <laughs> because the original Fiona was very powerful, but she couldn't master the darkness. Right. So will this Fiona have to try? We've yet to find out. Yeah, that's she. She doesn't care about him at this point. <laughs> no, she's and... just like I'm going to avoid him because that's how everything went wrong. So yep, and and you're very much on team fuck Clovis, but I'm sure we're going to find out that Clovis is is actually a nice tortured guy <laughs> as well who really needs her help, and she's going to feel so guilty about inflicting him with the darkness that she's going to have to try. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I, I like that because I like that magic because it's, it feels realistic. There's especially, I mean, Isekai in general have, has this problem of the overpowered protagonist and Fiona is definitely overpowered, but it doesn't feel unrealistic like a lot of the other ones do or most of the other ones. She's overpowered, but it, it doesn't eliminate the possibility of good storytelling. Right. And she's still creating. like, she's still physically weak. Yeah. So you know it's if she was attacked by assassins she might still have a problem it you're you're not going to like well the other thing they do is create some value for the male protagonist skills right. because while magic users can produce more powerful effects than a guy with a sword a guy with a sword can go much longer and his power comes from a much more reliable place and so they still need guys with swords standing on the wall to defend them from the monsters. Right. So, yeah, I, I do like the balance they create. There's physical danger. There's political danger. It, it's high drama. That's what I'm here for. That's what yeah. I was promised. Yeah. And, and the, the battles and the magic and stuff aren't really a central point of it. They're more just some quick set pieces to move things along in certain directions. And, you know, but that's just how a, it, an excuse to have a you know a pretty, pretty blue effect around some water flying around and. But and, I'm gonna say that's how all battles in all stories should probably be. They should further the plot. They should be maybe symbolic, even maybe maybe indulge yourself in a little in a little symbolism. Yeah. Maybe the dragon isn't always a dragon. Maybe sometimes it, it it symbolizes the lengths the male lead is willing to go to to follow the female lead. You know, that... which is a good point because the dragon <laughs> battle basically happens off screen. Yeah. So if you if you want to get into this for the action, I would uh, <laughs> I'd still recommend it. <laughs> this and again, so this is my limited. Um, my limited exposure to these romantic manhwa. The first one we read, I thought the art was acceptable. Yeah, it was, it was um, fairly standard. Like, on the, on the good end of standard. Yeah. This, by the end of part one, at the beginning, I kind of feel like they were using whatever character generator or layout generator um you mentioned like there's some set of assets somewhere yeah. that they relied heavily upon yeah and there's definitely they they do use 3d assets here and there um but for the most part it seems like they're putting a lot of effort into it especially towards the end of season one they create a lot more hand-drawn stuff yeah you can clearly see the difference. There are, there are several panels. Now, one thing they're using 3D assets or patterns for is to create these like intricate designs and, and laces and, and finishes on all the outfits. Mm -hmm. And I get the vibe, and this is kind of the vibe I get with a lot of shoujo manga too, is that there's a huge influence in 
fashion design art on the way these things look. Like in Sailor Moon, I'll go back to because that's the one everybody knows. <laughs> everybody has short torsos, long limbs, big round faces. And it's a perfect sort of silhouette or mannequin to hang pretty outfits on. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what this is. There there are so many times where like the the panel is an outfit and you have to like scroll a page to get the rest of it because the legs are so long. Yeah. And all of all of Fiona's outfits are amazing. Um, Seagrin, when he was a kid, I was disappointed by by his lack of neat outfit. He's just <laughs> wearing this like peasant outfit of shirt and trousers. And, and then like, the very first time we see him grown up, he's oh, decked that coat. out. That coat. <laughs> he's got this like it looks like what the British royal family when they dress up and pretend they're not old inbred monsters <laughs> it looks like what they're trying to go for yeah it's oh I love the coats I love Abel's coats that man rocks a cloak like nobody's business yeah. and and then Clovis has these sort of white crimson numbers that are pretty good. But the the absolute showstopper is Livia and her fancy red dresses. There's so many bright colors. There's so many weird patterns. But the patterns, like, you could tell she, whoever the artist is, just copied and pasted them in a layer in Photoshop. And it works, though. Yeah. Like, it just makes it pop. And it makes it pop in this weird way of like it looks like it looks like a collage on the page. It's very much how I would imagine somebody whose whose goal is to create a, a fashion design, constructing a fashion design. Yeah. But they they use it to further the story, and it gives it. All of the stories are kind of trying to do that, but in the in the first one we read, they were just. It's the same purple dress every time, but Fiona never wears the same outfit twice. Yeah. She just burns it every time. She <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh... so I'm, I'm never as like into the art with these, um, as like you and Andrew tend to be. Um, but this one definitely stands out as like, they are going above and beyond with the art and like making a genuine effort. You can tell the work that goes into it and it stands apart from many other series. Now, as I said last time, there's plenty of them that have really good art. This is, this is probably might be top 10. I can think of maybe two or three others off the top of my head that are actually better than this. So oh, yeah. uh, get prepared for that. But um, yeah, it's definitely up there. I was impressed. I, because I said that in the first episode that one of the reasons I never even approached this, despite being a big, we'll say sequential art fan <laughs> is because it looks cheap. And this has, it keeps the style of all the others, but it doesn't look cheap. It pops. It looks good. Mm -hmm. And I it adds something that I imagine the novel doesn't have. The novel doesn't probably have great visuals because it's a novel and it doesn't need them. And so there's a point to doing the adaptation. Yeah. Although I, I guess... There's a point to doing the adaptations in general because you're going to access a larger audience with these web comics. But if if it were my novel, I'd want this person. <laughs> <laughs> I do think for a lot of the, like the web novels and, and light novels, they they do do illustrations. You'll mm -hmm. see that a lot of times. Sometimes even the cover art is like an illustration from the novel, and so I th I think there's they do that. There's so there's like something to work off of. Um, there's you know some inspiration to take there. Well, and they'll tell you anyone who's published anything is is going to know that 
the the number one guidance is people do very much judge books by their covers so have a good cover do not scrimp on that i was just looking here um at the official release yeah so the official release uh still hasn't started uh for the second season yet for the official translation um <laughs> It it is coming out, but it hasn't been translated. Now, yet. does that mean when we say official, so somebody licensed this for like North American distribution? This is me getting back into the business. Side. This is this is on tapas, uh, like <clears throat> Kill of Illness is. Um, so, so they they just license an English. They're the they're the English translation. I think they might have the the actual series as well. Um, I don't know how to switch language here, but. Um, it's, it's my understanding that the, the original, uh, is on here is on tapas as well. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So again, you know, support the official release. Um, you can read, uh, three chapters for free. Uh, the first three chapters on tapas. Um, I think the first three chapters would be a pretty good indication of whether or not you want to do this. Yeah. They, they get pretty far in, in three episodes. Um, I think uh, it looks like Sigrun isn't introduced until episode four. You don't need Sigrun four. as long as you have Abel. I, like I said, the Abel, like, I, like call me father arc <laughs> is if she calls him father, that'll buy you a whole other season of teasing me with Fiona and Abel. Or not Fiona and Abel. That's no. Of Fiona and Sigrun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just need, and I think that's what they were trying to do with the Green family, is they're like, you know, we're not ready to, we're not even close to wrapping up this romantic plot, but here, here's some red meat for you. Yeah, which I appreciate. <laughs> I really do. Because oh, I, gotta... I am here for the revenge. That, the revenge. That, is, <laughs> that is my favorite thing about these villainous manhwa and manga is the villainous getting her revenge. I love justice. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? In a lot of cases, the, the revenge is the, the villainous lives her best life and, you know, shows them that they have no power over her. And I'm, I'm here for that too. Now in this case, she straight up destroys that family, which is great. <laughs> uh, that's also great. Sometimes so. I, th I think that's, that's a great, uh, moral to end the episode on. Sometimes <laughs> the best revenge is just living your best life, and sometimes it is the complete and systematic destruction of that person's life. Indeed, indeed. So we have to do the rating. We're gonna do oh. our our live rating. Do you do you want to do you want to venture a guess as to to what I'm gonna rate this at? I would. I I don't know how generous you are with your perfect tens so i'm gonna say a nine that's correct nine is exactly what i'm gonna rate this at uh i am very picky about tens yeah i think there's three manga i have rated at 10 out of the 600 and some <laughs> odd that i read so i think that's that's good it keeps the 10 meaningful do you can you guess which one of those uh 10 manga is Spy Family. Yeah, that would be a 10. Although I don't know if I read <laughs> that on it. But yeah, that would be one. I was thinking of another one, but oh. it's another one we talked about. Is it an isekai? No. Hmm. hmm. I'll have to think about it. It's it's one of my most recommended series. Oh, is it um, Freerin? Indeed. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so rating this 9 out of 10. Do you have a rating for it? <laughs> of the two I've read, this is the best. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess right now, it's I, I think maybe a 9 is, is probably a good spot for it. Mm -hmm. There, It's not like there is no room for improvement, but... Right. I don't know. If, if you listen to the other episodes of this podcast or you know, words about books or any of the other things. I'm not one to gush very often. I 
I often find problems with things. Well, I'm hoping that through this and, series, you have lots to gush about. <laughs> well, I was going to say, and, and this one, I don't have that many problems with it. Like, I'm sure there is room for improvement, but I'm perfectly happy with what I got. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably a good adaptation of a good story. Yeah, I think there's probably, on, on the list of recommendations that I gave to you, there's probably two tens on there oh, um probably find six seven eight nines <laughs> that sounded no, I, I get what you mean <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> uh and then a whole bunch of eights and probably probably a couple sevens so. well thanks for listening everybody i had fun with this uh, and we hope you enjoyed it uh, you can let us know what you think on social media and tell us if you have a series that you want us to cover. Uh, hit us up on Twitter. I'm at Isakai Sensei Sama, and Ben is at Benbo Swaggins. You can send us an email to Isakai Sensei Sama at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube at That Time I Got Reincarnated as an Anime Podcaster. And uh, please rate us on your podcast platform of choice. If you can't get enough of Ben talking about things that he read, you can check out Words About Books, which we've mentioned a couple times. I was going to say, for, for more information on a chronic condition that's affecting millions of Americans, please go to animepodcasterreincarnation.com to read more about dense female lead syndrome. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, uh, I have a bowl of mono to hit. I'll see you.